Think Realty Nation, it's Avi Golhar. Welcome to the Think Realty Podcast. Today's podcast is for you, the real estate investor that wants to know how to create wealth. As you know, the September issue of the Think Realty Magazine has our amazing, fantastic friend Sherman Ragland on the cover and titled, and, uh, and uh, right underneath this picture, it's given the name, The Wealth Creator. And if there's one thing that I take away from every conversation with Sherman, I take away something new. I learn something all the time, and he is such a genius when it comes to investing in real estate, building wealth, and of course, coaching others. He, is in a, he, is, he has his entire school for this, and I think it's phenomenal. But the one thing that I've learned from him over the years of knowing him is you want to be consistent and you want to take things one step at a time. You want to understand the types of deals that you're buying and due diligence is key. Building relationships is key and thinking bigger is something that I've learned from him as well. So I'm excited to uh, connect with him in a few minutes and then after uh, the interview with Sherman, then we'll talk a little bit about seller financing and how that could play an important strategy as a real estate investor for you going into the rest of this year and then, of course, 2021. Uh, a huge shout out to the podcast sponsor for today, Real Property Management, which is the largest residential property management franchise in North America, managing tens of thousands of properties for individuals, investors, and institutions throughout the country. Learn more at realpropertymgt.com or call 888-806-7088. <laughs> Without any further ado, Mr. Ragland, welcome to the show. Thank you, Abby. How you doing? Good. How are you? Great. So Good for the, yeah, likewise. For those of our listeners and viewers that don't know who you are, mm -hmm. the, the 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 crazy awesome genius in real <laughs> estate, building wealth that you know how to do very well. Give us a little intro background on who you are and what you do. Well, I, I was I first got interested in real estate at a very young age. Uh, I think I was probably a junior freshman or junior in high school. And I begged my mother to take me to this seminar at the local hotel. And she did. And we bit, you know, bought a, a home study, a home study system consisted of two cassette tapes and a booklet for like 1500 bucks. And uh, it was all about how to get started in real estate. I think the guy's name was McCorkle or something like that. Long story short, about six, seven years later, he wound up going to jail for fraud. Uh, but needless to say, despite the fact that the stuff that was in the program uh, certainly wasn't amount, worth the amount of money that we paid, not even close to it, uh, it didn't deter me from wanting to learn uh, how to get into the real estate game. And so I was very fortunate. Uh, I got my real estate license because I thought that was the way to go when I was a sophomore in college, so four years later. Uh, and then met a gentleman by the name of Jim Rouse, who created something called the Rouse Company, which was a big time, he was a big time developer here in the DC area. And he sort of mentored me a little bit, took me under his wing and shared with me sort of like what the real opportunities were in the commercial real estate space. And then I was very, very fortunate. I was one of like 15 people to get uh, an uh, all expense paid, uh, although they didn't call it that. That sounds a little hypey, but basically got a fellowship to go to the business school of my choice. And I picked the Wharton School of Business because of their background in, in uh, finance. And then when I got there, I realized they have a very, very, very strong real estate program. And from Wharton, got a job in the industry working for a Fortune 50 company. And then ultimately went out on my own. And, and, and when you go out on your own versus getting a paycheck, you tend to take a couple of steps down in terms of the size deals that you do. But I've been at this game now whew, 40 years, golly. 40 years I've been at this business and about 20 years ago started teaching other people how to get into the game because the, 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 the bottom line when it comes to real estate is a, or number one, you learn the business by doing it. And number two, if you don't have anybody who's willing to sort of show you the way you can make a whole lot of mistakes and lose a whole lot of money. Uh, and three, if you do have somebody who's willing to show you the ropes and sort of show you in your own backyard, once you sort of taste the taste of getting that first deal done, nothing's the same. Your life will never be the same. So uh, I've just had a good time and, I'm, and I enjoy having a good time. Uh, my kids are now getting into the business. My oldest, uh, my daughter, in fact, her birthday is this weekend and she's going to be 20. Uh, and then my, uh, my oldest son is 24 and my youngest son uh, is 19. And all three of them are in the real estate business. That's probably the most uh, uh, enjoyable aspect of what I do. 
That's incredible. Um, I, every time we meet, I just love hearing the stories. You've been, you've been in the game for such a long time. There's always something that, uh, that I can learn that, of course, the viewers, the viewers will learn today about your experience, about your background, about some of the challenges that even you faced uh, building your real estate empire and building your real estate business. Um, what does wealth creation mean to you in the real estate space? Oh, that's easy. And, it, and whether it's the real estate space or not the real estate space, wealth and freedom, and, and to me, those two words go together. Wealth and freedom can basically be translated into time and money. Uh, here in the D.C. area, we have a lot of people who make really fantastic incomes. You know, it's not unusual to find somebody, your neighbor even, who's making three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 a year as a salary. But typically somebody who's doing that as, as a job has a lot of money, so to speak, but they don't have any time. They don't have time to enjoy it. Uh, and then on the other hand, you know people who maybe have gotten laid off or reduction in force or temporarily uh, rift or whatever you want to call it. And they got plenty of time. Uh, but they got to watch every penny that they have. And so ultimately, the goal, I think, in life, especially in the United States of America, which last time I checked is not a socialist country, we're a capitalistic society, even though not pure capitalism, um, the goal is to have money and the time to enjoy it. And fortunately, we have a political structure and an economic structure that makes that possible if you sort of have the insider secret Dakota ring and know how to make that happen. And real estate, to me, is the ultimate tool for creating time and money, wealth and freedom. In fact, real estate's designed to make you rich if you actually look at it. it took me took me 20 some years to figure that out, but real estate's actually designed to make you rich. That's why so many rich people have real estate. So when it comes to the secret decoder ring, uh -huh. what's a pathway that you recommend for those that are flipping, those that are doing new construction, buying rentals? Yep. Is there a specific pathway that when you look at an overall strategy, you think to yourself, well, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. Is there a clear division of strategy there for you? So I'm actually teaching a master class tonight on raising money. And it's the first in a, of a series of eight classes. And the, the place I like to start, you know, Vince Lombardi, who of course the, the Lombardi trophy is named after, was the, the first coach to win a back-to-back -back Super Bowls. Um, and he used to start the football season and how apropos, here we are getting ready to start football season. But he used to start the football season with his players, and he would start off on the stage, and he would say, gentlemen, because they were all guys at that time, it was 1950s, 60s, right? He said, gentlemen, this is a football, and he would show them a football. And they're kind of like, we know what that is. <laughs> you know, that, That's what pays the bills. And his point was, by starting with the fundamentals, um, you can build on top of understanding the fundamentals. So in tonight's class, I was prepping for it. I'm going to share with them this. Can you see that okay, Avi? Yep, got it. Okay. Now, to the average person, that's like, okay, it's like a rectangle and a line on it. All right. So let me add a couple more things to it to see if it makes sense. Sure. All right. So I'm going to say, so is this now starting to make a little more sense? That makes sense. That looks like a, uh, yeah, that, uh, the term of a loan potentially. Bingo. You, you get it because you're an insider. Yeah. The vast majority, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the world, if I showed it to them in this state, they'd like, I don't get it, right? Mm -hmm. And this, lit, this literally is the key to building wealth, right? And, and, and so, so now let's put a little more detail and explain what it means. Okay. It, this, it's exactly what you said it was. It, it is... A, a graphic example of a 30-year mortgage, which is the typical tool that most people use to buy houses, both homeowners and investors. And if you stop and think about what is a 30-year mortgage, or, or, more, or more specifically, a 30-year amortizing, and that word amortizing is very important. Um, many people call it a 30-year fixed, but we'll call it a 30-year amortizing mortgage, is the word amortizing comes from the French word mort, or mortuary, which of course means death. And a 30-year amortizing loan is a loan that basically kills itself. So at the end of 30 years, nothing is owed. So stop and think about that for a second. If I plan on being alive 30 years from now, I ask you and ask all the guests, anybody here plan on being alive 30 years from now? I certainly do. Oh, yeah, and for I, sure. I, I got news for you. If I was 100 and you asked me that question, I'd be like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
So if you plan on being alive 30 years from now, what if I told you that there is a wealth building tool where um, you can get somebody else to put up the money to buy this wealth building tool. And if you're simply willing to wait for 30 years, it'll put a million dollars in your pocket. Are you willing to wait for 30 years to have this wealth building tool, put a penny, uh, put, put a million dollars in your pocket and somebody else will put up the money to buy it for you. And somebody else will pay the ongoing annual maintenance costs. All you have to do is be patient enough to wait for 30 years to have a million bucks. Well, Sherman, I, 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 I live in the, okay. I live in the Amazon prime right now society. I don't, yep. I, a two day shipping is too long for a guy like me. <laughs> All right. Like hair product ex is expensive and I can't wait for it. I need that now. I, I don't 30 years, whatever. What are you talking about 30 years from now? So my advice, and you said, you know, what advice would you give somebody who's flipping? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with, there's not, look, there's nothing wrong with flipping, but once you get really good at flipping and you get really good at paying off your debts and really good at paying your bills and paying for what you need, make sure you take one or two of those properties that you intended to flip and figure out a way to make it into a buy hold. Because if you're willing to turn it into a buy hold, at least in our market, I can't talk about other markets across the country, but in our market, that property, if you buy hold, could be worth $600,000 to you. Now, I know 600000 is not a million, but close enough, right? So in, in our market, the greater Washington, D.C. region, there's one particular area that investors really love. And the place that investors really love is Prince George's County. That's the county just to the east of Washington, D.C. The average value, the ARV, and everybody who's on this podcast should understand what ARV means, after repair value or average value, is uh, about $350,000 for those properties. Uh, and most of our investors learn the skills on how to buy it for below the ARV. Um, the other thing that we really teach and stress to our investors is there's ways you can put together small partnerships, family partnerships, friend and family, co college alumni, where you can put up, where you can basically get into a deal for less than 350, have an investor put up the money necessary to close the deal. So you're using none of your own money and after about three or four years, pay that investor off from the cash flow that comes from the property. But if you're willing to hang on to that property for a full 30 years, not only will you get the cash flow from that property, but that property will probably double in value in 30 years. Why? Actually, it'll more than double in value. Why? Because in the greater Washington, D.C. region, um, call it 30 miles away from the White House. So just draw a circle around the White House 30 miles out. Houses historically have doubled in value every 14.5 years. So every 14.5 years, a house will double in value in the D.C. region. That means a house that's worth $300,000 today will be worth $600,000 in 15 years. A house that's worth $300,000 today will be worth $1.2 million in 30 years. So if I can teach you how to buy properties with none of your own money, they're going to cost you roughly around three hundred thousand, where you're borrowing the bulk of it from a lender, and then the portion necessary to sort of fix it up if it's a sort of a carpet and paint kind of job yep. from a private investor. You can use the cash flow from the property itself to pay off that private investor in about three years, and they'll get a decent return, rough, roughly about a seventeen percent rate of return, and then you'll get all the cash flow from three years out. But more importantly that house is going to probably double in value in 15 and then double again in 30. So, so th there, there's, a, there's a really important concept here too. You're thinking about this and as you're watching and as you're listening to Sherman, also uh -huh. keep in mind there's a very big difference between good debt and bad debt. Bad debt, the, the good debt is your, what, exactly the formula, the strategy that Sherman's talking about right now. You are borrowing capital to invest in a cash flowing asset that is going to pay off the mortgage, which by definition, it, it, the, the, the root of the word means death. And so the mortgage itself is dying over time. It converges to zero because you're paying off the principal and interest. Initially, you're paying more interest than you are paying principal, but that's why the graph looks like that. It, it, yep, exactly. And so it, it seems like you're paying off peanuts on the principal initially. It's just like watching grass grow. You know, that's, that's what's going to happen. Except in this case, you are 
it's, it's like watching uh, the amount of principal you're paying off uh, grow at the rate of uh, grass growth. So it's, it's not happening as quickly as you would like. So good debt gives you the ability to borrow for a cash flowing asset. Bad debt is like going out and buying a pair of Louis Vuitton shoes. So it said another way, um, my son was asking me, you know, dad, when are you going to get a new car? You know, I've got a, I've got a Lincoln Navigator that's 10 years old with 200,000 miles on it. And I got a, Woo, baby. Uh, I got a, I got a Lincoln Mark LT truck. <laughs> It's got 153,000 miles on it. And I'm like, I hate car payments. I'm not getting the new truck. Yep. But there is going to come a day where the thing's just going to fall apart. And that's probably the next, you know, one of them's going to fall apart next three to five years. So yep. he's like, well, what would you get? And I said, probably a Bentley. And he's like, well, don't you want a Corvette? I'm like, I don't like Corvettes. That's not my style. So whether my son gets a Corvette or I get the Bentley, right? And yep. whether I buy it new or used doesn't really matter. The bottom line is the car payment on a Bentley even if it's used, is probably around $1,500 a month, right? Yeah. So good debt is buying a piece of real estate that will throw off ultimately $1,500 a month and then using the $1,500 a month that I earn for my real estate to pay for the car payment for the Bentley, right? Bingo. <laughs> Let the real estate buy my toys. I think Robert Kiyosaki said something about that in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, volume yep. one, right? Yep, um, that's right. Buy, buy, use your business to buy real estate and then use the real estate to buy your toys, right? Bad debt is going, well, I can't wait that long because it might take me three years to pay off my private investor. I need my Bentley now. Let me just go ahead and get a car loan. That's bad debt. Right. You're throwing that on a charge card. It's an auto loan. It's just not good. It makes no sense. And the thing you're buying is going to be worth less the second you drive it off the lot. Exactly. So, even, even if it is pre-owned. Even yeah, then. So, exactly. Even so I'm, then. Not saying, I'm not saying don't own toys. We all want right. toys. We all have toys. I got more toys than anybody else. Well, what I am saying is don't use your credit capacity to buy toys. Use your credit capacity to buy real estate. And Bingo. then use the real estate with the income from the real estate to pay for your toys. That's all I'm saying. That Bingo. to me is the classical definition of good debt, bad debt. And, and, that, and, and, and that's how you become a wealth creator, right? At the end of the day... Yes. You're using, you're using these concepts, these very simple concepts to your benefit, and you're creating assets that will have long-term value, and more importantly, the amount of cash flow also will increase exponentially as you pay off more of that principal. So it's like a win-win-win-win yep. situation. So if you're patient, if you're patient, if you're, if you're, in, if you're an if you're patient. kind of person, yes. right? And it took me a few years to figure that out. Uh, my first four or five years in the real estate business as a full-time real estate investor, I was hustling. I was initially wholesaling, and then I was fixing and flipping. And I was more than happy to get the $5,000, $10,000 checks for my wholesale fees. I was more than happy to get my $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 checks from buying, fixing, and flipping. But one day when I was about three, four years into the business, and I suddenly realized that a house that I had bought fixed, flipped, and made $20,000 on, another person came and bought it, lived in it for three years, and then they turned around and sold it. I made a quick 20, but they made 50 or 60. Yep. And I stopped and thought, wow, I probably could have made that 20 back in about a year or two if I turned it into a rental and gotten the pop on the profit, yep. or even better, hold on to it for 10 years or seven years even, and, ref and refinance and pull cash out from a refi, and if you and as you guys know, as, as we know, when you pull cash out on a refi, it's tax free. Yep. So it, it's it's like I said before. What, once you kind of figure out the code, you understand that real estate is designed to make you rich, but it tends to work better when you're a buy hold investor as opposed to a quick cash investor. So There's nothing wrong with quick cash, but at some point you want to do transition at least have part of your strategy. Is by hold. You, yeah, you have to diversify a little bit. Otherwise, you will continue be you'll continue to play the game without winning the game, and yes. that's what happens to a lot of real estate investors who get into this thing and they're like, "Well, you know what? I like the quick the quick cash, Sherman. I love the quick cash, but it's, you're not building wealth long term." So we could talk well, about I this. Know, I don't know if I can say this on your podcast and not get in trouble, but I once had a more I once had a mentor and a more more sophisticated investor, more sophisticated than me, say. Quick cash is like cocaine. It's like a drug, right? It, 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 well, I'm sorry. He didn't. I'm sorry. He did not say cocaine. Let me let me let me correct myself. He said it's like a drug. <laughs> he yeah. said it's, he said he said it to be very 
to be very accurate, he said it's like morphine, right? Meaning yes. there's times in your life when you're in a car accident, when something really bad happens, and you need an intense painkiller to get you through. Right. There are times in your life when you need cash, and that's one of the best ways to get cash. But if you're not careful, you can get addicted to the high and never be able to get off that cycle. And yes. again, there's nothing wrong with quick cash and quick cash from real estate. But if you, but the longer you're in the business and the longer you go, you'll look back on some of those deals you did and go, why did I sell that? That's right. Why didn't I just hang on to that? That was a really good and, rental. And it, why did I turn around it? it right? Yeah, and it would have made more sense at that time just to hold. Yeah. And you're looking back 10, 15, 20 years, in this case, 30 years, saying, yeah. holy cow, now the price, the property's doubled. I'm getting more cash flow. I have no right. payment. And I have a Bentley uh, payment at a $1,500 a month that my piece of real estate is, is covering. Um, so Sherman, if we wanted to get in touch with you and uh, yeah. kind of work with your school and uh, become a student of some of the strategies that you deploy, that you and your team deploy on a regular basis, where can we go to learn more about you? So we, we made a, a strategic shift uh, in March of this year. We, we own a 10,000 square foot facility, but obviously because of the COVID, blah, 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 blah. Uh, pandemic, blah, 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 right? right. Uh, we shifted from live in-class classroom, predominantly sort of regional, super regional, to 100% online. And folks can find us on the internet at uh, realinvestors.com. Uh, and we had a real special offer in the Think Realty magazine. Uh, if you go to, um, I think it's uh, free, uh, think free CD, think free cd.com. Uh, there's a special offer to get some training to get started for people who are brand new to the business. Okay. Um, but otherwise, you know, we do live training three times a week on Tuesday nights, East, East Coast time. Uh, we do something called the Dealmaker Workshop where we bring investors together who have money with investors together who have deals yep. and actually do some matchmaking. Uh, then on uh, Wednesdays, we do what we call the Real Estate Incubator which is really sort of a very open free form. Hey, I got questions. How do you do subject to, how do you do lease option? Very free form for a couple hours. And then on Thursday nights, we do the master class. And the master class is usually eight o'clock again, East Coast time. East Coast time. Yep. And we usually do a series. So we're just getting ready to kick off the series on uh, raising money uh, and doing nothing down deals and sort of the whole, I hate this word, but it, it makes sense. The whole ecosystem right. of uh, raising money for, for, for doing the deals. And, and the website for that is? Uh, again, you can just simply go to realinvestors.com. Awesome. Uh, and that's the best way to find us. Perfect. Sherman, this has yeah. been super insightful. Uh, as Thank always, you. it's a pleasure. Uh, even these, th th you take a concept just like the one that you drew, mm -hmm. and every time, right, it's just constant confirmation for me that keep doing it, stay involved, be long-term, and don't buy tulips because it's the thing to do. Uh, well, I would I would quote Maya Angelou, and I think it's very apropos for real estate investors. And I think An Maya Angelou, and this is a this is Sherman's interpretation. I think she said something to the effect of, "Do the best you can with what you know, and when you know more, do better. Do the best you can there with you what go. you got as an investor, and when you there learn you more, do more. You know, stay connected to Think Realty, stay connected to the events, stay connected to the podcast, and when you know more, do more." But do what you can with what you got. I couldn't have said it better myself. Sherman, thank you so much for jumping on with me and taking some time. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Always. You got it. Think Realty Nation. This next segment is brought to you by Real Property Management, the, the largest residential property management franchise in North America, managing tens of thousands of properties for individuals, investors, and institutions throughout the country. Learn more at realpropertymgt.com or call 888-806-70. Eight, eight. Let's talk about seller financing uh, for, for a quick second. Now, here's the deal. When you are working on seller financing type of opportunities, you want to absolutely make sure that the due diligence, that the homework that you do on the property is second to none. You want to make sure that the valuation is coming in right and that the homeowner or the home seller is and understands exactly the type of deal they're signing when they are financing the property for you. That's essentially what a seller financing opportunity or deal is. 
you may put a little bit of capital down, but the homeowner, because they have all the equity and they generally don't have a note or they don't have any debt on the property, will say, hey, no problem. I'll go ahead and sell or finance this for you. You don't have to go to a bank. You don't have to go to a lender. And it gives you a nice entryway into acquiring a property without having a whole lot of money down. The interesting thing about this is you can use this in a variety of different ways. You can go to thinkrealty.com, uh, read this article titled Seller Financing, uh, written by Nationwide Secure Capital. But let me give you a strategy that I found to be very beneficial in a seller financing capacity. Probate real estate, for example, is a means to move property through the probate system from, from, the fo from the person that has passed away to their heirs. Most of the time, the heirs are uh, absentee owners, meaning they're not, they don't live in the city or in the state or in the county in, uh, in which the property is located. But something still has to be done with that property. If you can work with the petitioner or the attorney that is working on that case, that probate case, and you can figure out a way to purchase the property. As long as it's approved by the judge, you can purchase the property from the family. And generally speaking, you're helping them out because they want to move on, their loved one has just passed away, and it's a very delicate situation. But if you make it a win for them, it's going to be a win for you. Because your cash basis in these probate real estate deals can be relatively low, that can be relatively low if you do it right. And again, the primary objective, the primary goal is to help the families that are going through a crisis. So if you can do that, present them with a fair offer and say, hey, here's what, here's what I can offer you, here are all the repairs that would need to be done, etc. It's a very interesting opportunity. Example, let me put some numbers to this. If your acquisition for a property is forty dollars or $50,000 and you put in maybe ten dollars or $15,000 in renovation, it didn't need a whole lot of work to begin with. You find out that the property is valued at about $110,000 or $120,000. You can sell or finance a little bit of that acquisition price for the new buyer, and that is cash flow every single month for you. So keep that in mind as a potential tool that you can use in your tool belt to grow your overall portfolio. Think Realty Nation, we've got to run. You want to get in touch with us, you can get, go head on over to thinkrealty.com. Uh, Start the conversation because ultimately nobody cares more about your money than you do. This, uh, this podcast was uh, brought to you by Real Property Management, the largest residential property management franchise in North America, managing tens of thousands of properties for individuals, investors, and institutions throughout the country. Learn more at realpropertymgt.com or call 888-806-7088. With that said, Think Realty Nation, it's been fun. Happy investing.